It is a great honor to present Fernando Batista giving our keynote address. He is currently a senior editor of infographics at National Geographic. He has been part of the National Geographic magazine family in Washington, DC since 2007. In 2012, Fernando was named one of the top five most influential graphic artists of the last 20 years, having won more than 200 awards, including the Peter Sullivan Award, an award best known as the Pulitzer for infographics. And without further ado, I thank you for being here, Fernando. Thank you very much for the introduction. So it's really a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you. Sorry for my thick accent, I'm from Spain. And when I moved to DC, I didn't speak English. So I, so I try to improve, but I think that I'm old, so I think it's coming more and more complicated. No? So, but well, I'm going to show my work in National Geographic and the people that work with me. I think that 50% will be for print and 50% will be for digital. So you will see animation and all kinds of things. And well, let me share my screen. I hope that will work. Can you see my screen? Yeah. So, well, National Geographic um, has more than 130 years, and there are were always artists in National Geographic, you no, know, working in uh, as part of the staff, you no. Know? And I follow a little bit that kind of tradition. Um, this is an illustration and a text that I wrote and I paint for Traveler Magazine. It's not really scientific illustration, but they create a video about uh, this illustration that has some kind of background with my history. You know? So this is an illustration that I did about my city, Bilbao, in the north of Spain, in the Basque Country. And usually I work with, uh, with models. Sorry. Uh, it's not working. Sorry. Yeah. So, and this is uh, to to make this illustration. I made this model by hand, and this is a video. I'm going to put just one minute and a half. I put. Pues Bilbao es una ciudad pequeñita, tiene unos 350.000 habitantes más o menos. Lo llamamos el Bocho porque está, el Bocho es como un agujero, está rodeado de montañas, entonces está cruzado por el río Nervión y bueno, pues está en el País Vasco, en el norte de España. Yo nací en el centro de Bilbao, en Indauchu, que es como el corazón de la ciudad. Y bueno, para los bilbaños yo creo que es la mejor ciudad del mundo. <risa> National Geographic para mí es pues, como, pues, como un sueño, ¿no? el, el estar trabajando aquí. Pues claro, yo echo de menos Bilbao, pero profesionalmente es una oportunidad. ¿no? Pues yo empecé a trabajar en, en infografía en el año 93, en el periódico El Correo. Allí pasé unos 14 años y fue donde aprendí lo que es la infografía, a manejar la, la parte periodística, a diseñar los gráficos y sobre todo a contar historias visualmente. La escultura yo creo que es la marca de mi trabajo. La gente no sabe que muchas veces hay una escultura detrás de mis gráficos, que uso esas esculturas para, para coger información, para hacer las ilustraciones. Entonces se me ocurrió la idea de hacer una ilustración sobre Bilbao. Pero, ¿qué pasaría si, si esa ilustración sería pues, como un modelo de, de mí haciendo esa ilustración? ¿no? Me pareció que era interesante, era como otra como colocarte enfrente de, del ilustrador cuando está haciendo la obra, ¿no? y eso sería bonito. So, so I, you can find the video you want in YouTube, but you know I think it's a very nice introduction about my 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 life, no? So, and in this illustration, for example, and in another illustration, sometimes I hide stuff. Like for example, it's a portrait of my wife. I love Star Wars, so I put a a, a Darth Vader and books that I like it. An artist like Velázquez, Vermeer, or Ansel Kiefer, no? So, in my graphics, as as mentioned, I combine analog with digital, and during this 13 years in National Geographic, I produced more than 100 projects for print and digital. So my background, I studied fine arts in Spain. 
seven years, five years uh, drawing, and five year and two years painting. And I'm going to show you some of the graphics that I produce for the magazine. This is El Duomo in Florence. I traveled to Florence to explain how it was built, the biggest dome made with brick in the world. This is a poster. So this is the other side of the poster. And I, I compare the different domes through the time from the Pantheon in, in Rome, Hagia Sophia. And on, on the right, we have the Capitol in Washington. Oh, I make another poster about sharks. This is a, a gallery with some of the most iconic sharks. And in the background, we have the Megalodon. So, and people don't know that there are, I, I will say that 90% of the times I make, I make a model no? for reference, like this one, or another how the tiger shark bites. Or these big cats. So it's another poster, the skull in the background and the, and the teeth and the claw and in actual size. It's acrylic and a little bit of digital. And I hide a sketch in one of the legs. There are another video how I made. Or oh, the Emperor Penguin, no? A new discovery how the Emperor Penguin can trap um, air in the plumage and propel to basically escape from the leopard seal. This is a new information. So basically was create something totally new, no? So to do this kind of graphics, uh, I just was looking for artistic look and I create this background with acrylic. I put a little bit of grease and some models, a real feathers. And this is the final piece. Well, this is a time, a timeline. I'm I start to feel old, 55. So from left to right, you can see my progression. So I hope that a few years later I can add another more. <laughs> so my first contact with graphics, I think that probably was the models. No, when I was a kid and I made models from Star Wars, like this one. Some of the, these models I keep in in Spain, in Bilbao, my city, and I a big fan of sci-fi and comic. So I create comics when I was a kid and I study anatomy with Tarzan. And when I watch movies that I like it, I create models with clay like this one. Oh, and this is the first gift to my wife in 87. He still love uh, classic black and white movies. This is my second gift to my wife. Uh, this is a character that I designed for her. And it's funny because I built in 87, I made it. And in 2002, if you watch Harry Potter, you can find Dobby that is very, very similar. So <laughs> I studied fine arts seven years. This is some of the works that they produced there is we think an acrylic. This is a portrait of Yukio Mishima. And I continue drawing. This is ink. Basically, I love to work with the light and simplify. And I experiment with of course, when you are learning, you try different things. No, this is a fossil, some kind of painting that look like a fossil. And when I was around 16, 17, I, I have a lot of interest in stop motion. No? And, and with some friend, we create some stop motion animation. No? This is a character that I built. And of course, at that time in Spain, it wasn't like today. No? So it was basically recycling stuff. No? The material that I used to build this head was epoxy com composite to repair pipes, far for our dogs, the eyes from my sister doll, and the skin from my mother's shoes. No? So it was basically recycling. No? So, and I, I play different techniques. I bought an airbrush. The, the young people probably don't, don't know that. So they know probably from the Photoshop. But at that time, it wasn't Photoshop. No? So you, you need to to work with, with traditional, no? So this is a Batman that I, 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 I love the movie from Tim Burton and I make the, that portrait with a brush. And this is another model that is a pterosaur, but of course, at that time it was an infographic. So I combine a pterosaur with a bat's wings. So it's not really accurate, no? But, and now my old hobbies are part of my way to produce graphics, no? So this is one graphic that for me is special. Uh, it's all pterosaurs. So it's a uh, four pages. I work with Mesa Sumaker. She was the researcher. And 
this is a detail of the head. This is a portrait of the Quechaco Altus, the one of the biggest one. You can see the, the circle is the eye in actual size. And I compare the anatomy of the bones of, you know, bears, bats, and human. No? We share the same bones, but different length and, and shape. No? And the process in National Geographic is basically my role is first, the concept. Second, selection of the information from, I always work with one researcher or more, sometimes, depending on the size. I sketch several so uh, ideas. And I design for print and digital. No? So, for example, if for, for digital, I will I will need to prepare the, the storyboard. No? And I decide the art of the style of the graphics in both platforms. No? And on top of that, all need to be accurate. No? So, and all began with this, no? paper and pencil, rough sketches with a illustrator and pencil. I refine the sketches and make some kind of distribution of the information. And in this case, we make a reconstruction of one of the pterosaurs. No? So Mesa um, compile all the information. This is some kind of blueprint for me. So all the measurements from, I think, like three or four different experts. I built a model with that um, blueprint. And this model allowed me to keep the proportion and play with the design. No? So and from there, I build other models. Sometimes are pieces. This is another pterosaur, the head. Or the fingers for me is very helpful. And during all the process, the experts check the graphics. This is some of the feedback from the experts, and with some kind of correction for the bones and stuff. No, so and for me, it's very very important that the graphic are easy to read and need to be very 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 organized. No, so I spend a lot of time. It's not just that need to be beautiful. That of course I try that that looks nice. No, so but need to be organized and. So people need to read in very easy way and need to understand, no? And so I need to pick up the best information, cool information and interesting, no? So, and this project, for example, I was very lucky because uh, uh, was, they asked for a cover and I designed some covers and was published and I think that's more than 50% of the international edition no? from Japan or Germany, so. And the question that all people tell me, why I, do I use sculptures? Well, this is like your personal model. This is orangutans. And with this one, I can, I help me to create this kind of graphics, no? So it is kind of visual information. You can get the perspective, you can get the light, you can get the volume, and it's very helpful. So, or this one, no? The octopus. You can see how it works. You can get tons of information, no? When I combine a, a sculpture with illustration, I think I can, I can make better, better graphics. No, this is the graphic that I work with Mesa Chu and Shizuka uh, Aoki. That she worked with me. Um, she's a scientific illustration, and sometimes when I don't have enough time, she helped me to to produce uh, some of the anatomical drawings. No, so in vector. So in this graphic, we explain it's just one page how smart are the the octopus and the distribution of the brain, no? 35% brain in the in the head and 65% in the arm. No? So, and in this case, basically I take a photo with my iPhone of the model and I add a little bit of Photoshop and the uh, internal organs are vector with a little bit of Photoshop. No? So, and it's just one page. No? And I'm not the only one to, to use models. No? Uh, we think that now all is digital and for example, in these movies that People probably don't know that the city in Blade Runner was really a model, or in The Lord of the Ring was another model, or in Harry Potter was another model. Of course, there are special effects on top, or Star Wars. No, in this, I'm a big fan of Star Wars, and I, in, I think I learned, I learned a lot to make models and, and tricks and stuff. In this case, the models maker used hundreds of key, key tweaks to create the illusion of people in the, no? And in our animation, we play a little bit with that, no? We need to be very, very creative, no? This is my last project that I published uh, just a few days ago. It's about Sabertooth, the famous cat. And this is a project of four pages. This is the flap. And this is the internal gayfold, three pages. And I compare the anatomy of a lion, a mother lion and a Sabertooth, no? This Mylodon populator. New information uh, show that was bigger than, than we expect. No, they found a skull in Uruguay 
that they were around close to 1,000 pounds. No? In the back, you can see the skull and in actual size and the comparison with a lion. No? So this is a beetle. And this is part of the information, the comparison. From the thickness of the bones, the angle of the, of the, of the legs, of the limbs, tons of information. In this project, I think that we work, particularly the researcher work with around 10, uh, 10 uh, experts, how they bite. And we just published yesterday um, animation, no? but I'm going to show you how I make the models, no? so how I can make a great model. No? So usually the material that I use is super sculpty, some kind of synthetic clay, wire, aluminum foil. I use dentist tools because they are very, very sharp and I like it, and Vaseline, no? so just to smooth. So first thing of all, I prepare the, the, I find the right skeleton for the proportion. I design a little bit the, the pose that I want. And I start to, on top of this skeleton, I put the, 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 the wire, I cover with aluminum foil, and I start to add layers of Sculpey. This is in progress, and this is the final one. No? So when I have this model, I have all the information to rotate the light, texture, all the thing that I want. No? And one thing that we try is surprise our readers with new techniques and ideas. No? We just published yesterday in Instagram one animation about in vertical format. We are very focused now in the phone because it's when we have more audience. And this is the animation. No? Is For Instagram, need to, you probably know that uh, need to be chapters of 50 seconds. So it's tricky. But this is the Tales of the Giant. Don't be scared. This massive cat prowled South America one million years ago, and it's the biggest saber tooth ever known. It hunted rhino like beasts, giant sloths, and other enormous megafauna. A fossil from Uruguay, the largest saber-toothed skull found so far, shows us just how big they really were. A full reconstruction of the skull includes their epic teeth. Imagine coming face to face with Smilodon. It weighed almost twice as much as a modern lion. But this cat had a sloped back, like a hyena's. It was the ultimate bodybuilder of the savanna, with bones that were reinforced with strong outer layers and with massive muscles. Those powerful limbs came in handy when it was dinner time. Smilodon would stalk prey and then tackle from behind, saving its saber teeth for one specialized bite. Its mouth could open much wider than a lion's. The cat struck with its canines and then pulled backwards to tear the throat of its prey, leaving it to bleed out quickly. Huge flat teeth were designed to kill with one bite. In contrast, a modern lion has thick round teeth to hold and suffocate prey. If a saber tooth tried that, its teeth might break. The reign of the saber-toothed giant ended, and a new predator arrived on the scene. Humans. We may have smaller teeth, but we bite with more dangerous weapons. Like actual sabers. This animation was a challenge because we, we were in the quarantine, so complicated. This is the living room of our apartment. And well, I think that is, it was the first time that we create one animation in, in, in working remotely, no? That was a challenge, no? This is another project that I work with four researchers. Nessa Sumaker was one of them. We spent three months to create a, a supplement, a poster with two sides. This is a beetle and the researcher spent around 400 hours to, to research. One second, that is. Look like it's not coming. 
Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the other side. Sometimes look like it's hooked the presentation. This is the other side. And to produce the illustration, I simplify and try to get the right color and, and light. No? All the time I'm practice. So this is a digital painting in 15, 20 minutes. On the right is a photo and on the left is a digital painting. No? Just simplify and get the right colors and light. No? To do the uh, illustration, I create like 50 pencil illustration. This is a detail of the pencil and it's the final. And this is the basic process, no? pencil, basic volume in the second step, a little bit of color in the third steps and more color in the fourth steps. No? So I use Photoshop for all the process and I drew around 50, 50, 50 birds in well, and, and the design and a, a lot of stuff in less than three months. No? This is another graphic that I did a few years ago about La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. It's a, a church. And this is a detail. In brown is the part that is finished, and in gray, the part that will be finished the next year. And to do this, I traveled to Barcelona too. And to do this, this is a detail. Uh, I make a technical drawing with computer, with Illustrator, the classic perspective. And I translate all the blueprints, all the measurements, one by one to, to create the aligned, clean illustration. I print around 170% bigger and using pencil, I add this, the texture and shadows and I scan and with the computer, I start to add layers of colors, no? like watercolor. And this is the final piece. So at the end is this kind of the best part of the, ana the analog um, thing and the best part of the handmade, no? So, or this project about the uh, Amazonia, no? So I traveled to, to the Amazon to, I spent one week in the Amazon with two different experts looking for different species of trees, different animals. And to produce that graphics, I create in the big trees first with uh, with pencil and a little bit of watercolor and you can see each tree was one group in photoshop was individual so i can move the trees so at the end i have a file with more than 1000 layers so and there was one moment that was some kind of mess because it looked like anything but little by little so I start to look this is some of the maria can another scientific illustration. She was the inter in, in National Geographic and she helped me with some of the animals. So for example, the, that appeared. So, and this is the final detail, no? So, oh, this is another graphic like the Saber 2, the Helicoprion, another story that I propose, the same kind of design for pages. This is a, look like a shark. It's not really a shark, it's a right fish, but they have this kind of weird uh, show in the, in the mouth, no? Like a circular show. This is a sketch, and this is the the gable in the interior. So how they bite, the different theories of the of this kind of a spiral with teeth, and in the background, this is a real fossil, a photo from the from the expert, and I combine with the illustration and I make a reconstruction of the teeth. No? So this is a detail how they strange and weird. So work, and I make a model. This is in our apartment. My, my wife wasn't very, very happy, but was some kind of mess. This is some of the models, a small scale and bigger scale, teeth. And for the animation, the inspiration was this kind of movies, the horror movies. I was thinking, this is perfect. This creature is perfect for a horror movie. So this is a little bit the inspiration and how can we engage and tell the story to the reader. No? So, so when I was a kid, I, I was scary with this movie, but I don't really like it. And with this kind of concept, this is the nation. Curse of the Buzzsaw Killer. In swirling oceans 275 million years ago, lived one of the top predators of its time. 
the Gila Capri. It was like a mutant creature from a horror movie. It looked like a shark with a terrifying buzzsaw in its jaw. Its bite was as strong as a modern crocodile's. How could such a bizarre jaw work? The angle of its mouth was bigger than a great white shark. Teeth pushed the prey deep inside. The jagged spiral was forced into a notch in the upper jaw. Prey was sliced in two. No less frightening was its size. Twice as long as a great white, it had fewer fins and a narrower body. Don't get close to these blades. They're four inches long and angled backwards. <laughs> New teeth pushed older ones deep into the whirling rotations in the jaw. Teen monsters had two rotations. Adults had four circles of flesh-ripping chompers. More than 150 of the fossils have been found. The odd shape mystified scientists for over a century. The Gila Caprion went extinct long ago, but beware the curse of the buzzsaw killer. It's always wise to play it safe in the water. <laughs> so in this kind of project, uh, you need, we need to compress a lot of information in just a couple of minutes. The first thing is the storyboard. I create that one. And after I had the model, we create a photogram photogrammetry of the model. This is the photographer of National Geographic. They shoot around 200 uh, photos of the model. This is Mark. And with this model, Monica Serrano creates a 3D model with all the texture of the, of the real model. That is pretty cool, no? So, and the Monica and Diana. Marques refine the model. And this is to create a feeling of underwater. So it was tricky. So using two, two tanks, one in front of the camera and another on top, you can get this kind of feeling that is underwater. And another was more simple, no? like a fan and, you know, the theme. You know, totally B movies, no? So. Uh, the actor came from the staff in National Geographic, this is Victoria Jagger, in the photo studio. And this is Oscar in the photo studio as a study the, the team. No? So this is another project that was very cool that is about under London, a new metro line. Uh, they are building, uh, they are digging a new metro line in, in London and they found remains from, you know, mammoths, Romans, Vikings. I traveled to London one week, and I, in this graphic, I make a reconstruction of six spots for print. And for this is one of the of the spots. I make a model of one of the houses, a Tudor house, and I I paint. And for digital, was the first animation with paper, no? Wait, sorry. I think I repeat the. This is the Daisy create some of the of the models was the inter and this is another models a little more models all was watercolor paper this is the biggest model that we create and this is the animation Once upon a time, London was a very different place, and woolly mammoths roamed the tundra. Much later, as it got warmer, nomads built wooden tracks through marshes to make travelling and hunting easier.
People started coming from near and far. And the Roman period was a time of immense growth. But living in peace wasn't always possible. Queen Boudicca led the revolt against the Romans in 60 AD. The voice is from the Philogic song. the city's population died during the Black Death. William Shakespeare wrote his plays during the Tudor period. During the Great Plague, many thousands died and the doctors... Well, you can find the video on YouTube, it's a little bit one minute more, and this is how some kind of behind the scenes. I make, you know, each scene in this kind of animation, you need to design because you need to build. So you need to know very well how much you need to build. So this, we use watercolor paper, more than 100 or 200, I don't know exactly the number. So, and we fake the perspective. So, the buildings that are close are bigger than the buildings that they are farther away. And the paper has some kind of special texture. You know? When you put the light, all came alive, and it's very, very rich. And it's another way to tell the story. You know? With this animation, you want the most important power in UK about the and it's the first time that I make a sculpture with paper. No? This is without the special effects, this is with the special effects. Oh, this is another graphic. This is a visualization of the Bible. So it's the Old Testament and the New Testament by chapters. And we analyze 400 um, remains of the of the text, and in these bars under the the this kind of comic, you no, know, with uh, some kind of scenes or highlight of the of the Bible, these are the fragments from the scrolls that we have text, you no. Know? So we explain the readers how much text we have, or how old we can go with the with the text in the Bible, you no. Know? was very, very hard to, to study and to create, no? And for digital, we create another animation. In this case, instead to use a watercolor paper, we're recycling paper and cardboard. So all the stuff that you see over there was cardboard from, from the trash. And this is an eye paint. This is a, a, a monk writing some chapter of the Bible. All is paper. Just the head and some kind of uh, pottery was with Sculpey. And we used different animation like puppet or some motion. This is Dragon Frame, the program that we use for the animation stone motion. It's some kind of Photoshop that allows to see the different chapters, different the different story frames. And this is just we shoot 12 frames per second. This is one scene with the with the Virgin and the and Jesus, and this is just to prepare one of the of the frames. No, imagine when you have, you know, thousands of frames. No? And this was the first experiment with Instagram, and we create behind the scenes and we chop the the video. We get a lot of traffic. And this is the video, no? I'm going to put just the beginning. Along the shores of the Dead Sea, 
three Bedouin shepherds were tending their flocks when one of their goats strayed from the herd. All the background is cardboard. Thinking it had wandered into a cave, one of them threw a stone to scare the animal out. The unexpected sound sparked their curiosity. And inside, the young shepherds uncovered clay jars that contained one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of the 20th century, the oldest biblical text ever found, the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The scrolls were handwritten some 2,000 years ago on durable animal skin parchment, with a few written on papyrus. They were mostly composed in Hebrew from right to left, with sheets written in columns, then sewn together, creating a single scroll. For safekeeping, some of them would be wrapped in linen and encapsulated in tall jars. The scroll was eventually replaced by the codex as the format for Christian manuscripts. They were made by folding sheets of papyrus and stitching them together. As time passed, codices began to grow larger and more complex. During the medieval period, books were reproduced by hand. Monks spent their days copying texts in Latin and Greek, while others illustrated the pages. Let me show you my favorite scene. We Why are the hides of hundreds of sheep or calves? And this is my favorite. But it was the introduction of the printing press that transitioned the Bible from the Middle Ages into the early modern world. This invention revolutionized book production, ultimately making the Bible available to the masses. And this is one of the scenes without the special effects. All this is motion and also was built. And this is with the special effects. And we hide all the team that work was in the frame. And there are a, a famous infographic uh, framing on the wall too. And this is an illustration with the lion on the, on the right of my city. Or oh, this one about giraffes, no? I love giraffes. So I made this graphic, uh, the comparison between a okapi, a human, and, and a giraffe, the anatomical difference. The first thing we traveled to, to Baltimore Zoo to, to meet with some of these uh, specimens. This is with Riley and Taylor, graphic assistant and cartographer. Um, we saw the giraffe running. This is the female. The male is Sisa. They were very, very happy. And I create this comparison from the bones, circular system. Sisuka Aoki helped me in, in that one too, with the shape in illustrator of some of the organs. And I always like to start with a pencil and from there with uh, real models and, and computer. No? And this is the process to create one of the illustrations. No? First, the pencil, uh, a background, and with layers in Photoshop, I paint. This is the Okapi. So, or this one, no, the, the Vikings. So this is a cover that I produced, was a bestseller. And to create the character that is a reconstruction of a chief, this is one of the sketches. I traveled to Denmark, to a Viking museum, and I produced, well, we produced, because there were a team, uh, 10 pages, One side is a map and the other is a Viking ship. So I made this kind of reconstruction. All was accurate. And well, of course, so I was the model. I, I am always the model of my family. And I, my job is to tell that part of the story that photos and text cannot, cannot do it, no? So, and we create our second animation with paper, but with different style, no? The part that I really enjoy is designing the characters, the construction with paper, was paper, different kind of paper, just white. This is the joints. And this is a couple of sets. 
this is painting to a scale set, all is cardboard. And this is uh, Daisy. I have the idea of using shadows, so using some kind of prosthetic pieces of cardboard. And this is the animation. I'm going to put that a little bit. I am old now, but I remember long ago when we Norsemen ruled the sea. As our northern kingdom expands, the secret of our success lay in how we built our fearsome longships. Imagine a young boy named Harald, who yearns to see the world. His father is a shipbuilder. He shares the secret to... I'm going to show you some of the most... We saw the construction. Patient for building good. We use the ships for exploration, trade, warfare, and even burials. Okay, what did I use? Plastic bags from the, from the For Harald, the it's the beginning of a long journey. So, you can find it in YouTube. This is... And it is here that Harald draws away. his last breath. So we did the mythology and the real history to, to show the construction. And now, the I've invited Harald to my home. For I live in the realm of Asgard. My name is Odin, father of the Nordic gods. This is the team that work. I work with with um, another person basically full-time one month and a half and the other people are part of the staff that uh, they help me help us no? so sometimes with the topography or the map or the sound or sometimes you need to animate and we need three, two three or four people to move in staff or oh, another project about easter island so i traveled to hawaii for a new experiment to move one of these statues in vertical position a new theory and so I was part of the experiment, three group of people pulling ropes. I'm the one to see the, the guy with the hat is I was pulling and sometimes they start to fall. No, So I make always when I travel, I make sketches and I share with the expert there and I get comments. But of course, I'm the model again. So this is a, some of the pencil illustration. And from there, I create a composition. I make a acrylic with watercolor and um, color pencil, and this is the final piece. No? For digital, we create our first stop motion animation. This is a test. It was Christmas, so it was a matrushka with some kind of Star Wars figurine, oh. and people, uh, our bosses, uh, approved, and we start to cost the construction of the set, paper mache. I customize wrestling figurines to create the people, and we shoot. I'm going to do Jeffrey ID. Although some believe extraterrestrials moved the Moai, scientists have more earthbound theories. So we saw the five theories, how they move the Moais, with different on Moai on a tree trunk. And with this nomination, uh, with this uh, animation, we got, well, you can find in, the, in YouTube too, we got Emmy nomination for new approach. So we Can went to New York for the ceremony. Walking with Giants, National Geographic Magazine Digital Edition. Lost and Found. And we didn't win. But well, I think that was 
cool to be there, no? And this is just the final project. So that I'm going to show you is a Trajan column in Rome, 2000 years old. This is the print version. I create a model with a cutaway to show the interior. We create a reconstruction of the colors of the column, working with several experts, the Roman Forum, how it was built, the tomb in the base of the, of the column. This is a poster of five pages. And we create our second stop motion animation. I'm going to show you just a little bit. In the heart of Rome lies a mystery. Trajan's Column is one of the most impressive monuments to survive the fall of the Roman Empire, and researchers are still trying to understand how it was actually built. So for, if some, for the idea that you can travel to the past, our character using a time machine travel to Rome, and we explain all the process to build Cut from a quarry north of Rome and floated up the Tiber River to the work site. How they carved in the drums. Within each drum was oh, carved do do? windows and a staircase, allowing access to the top. So how they move the drums, the lifting tower. To grip the drums, slots were carved into the marble for Lewis irons, which held the marble from the inside. Power for lifting the drums was a series of capstans working in concert, each pushed by perhaps a dozen men as well. So. To see what's happening inside the lifting tower, let's take away one of the outer walls of this model. All is, is in stone motion. And visually you can see pretty well how- Once the drums are set, the craftsmen smooth the surface and begin work on the 656 foot long frieze, which tells the story of Emperor Trajan's war victory. And we finish with the tomb and some kind of fun that you see through all the Trajan's column has stood for more than 1900 years and was deeply influential. Over and we, we got our second Emmy nomination and we didn't win again. So we thought that the third one will be the good one. No? So, and that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fernando, for that presentation. That was incredible. I am blown away by your work right now. <laughs> uh, well, I, I really do want to, to see one of the I have here so people can see a little bit close wow. one of the models. You probably know this character that was. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So, Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to our questions now. So we have a lot of comments rolling in, a lot of positive feedback. Okay, so Nuria asks, thanks for your work. Where is the line between information and entertainment? One could argue there would be not so much artistry needed to deliver the information. We all find it beautiful, of course, but how do you consider where is the limit to what is necessary and what is not? Yeah, I think that um, I always try to find this kind of balance in information. So, and, 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 need to be first thing easy to read and need to engage the reader. So usually in the graphics, uh, there are a lot of information. So, but I think that always we need to sacrifice. I think that that is the goal. No? So the readers and more you, you, we are thinking for digital, the readers, they need to be, to read something quick and get information in an easy way. No? So I spend, you know, probably, 25% of 25% of my time is just designing and make some kind of selection of the information. No? So I think that, and in the animation, I think that we, I think that we are allowed to engage the readers with some kind of, you know, fun uh, themes. But at the end, you have in two minutes of uh, one animation, you have tons of information too. So just, I don't know, 
10, 50 percent of the animation is this kind of joke to, to keep the attention. One thing that we know is in Instagram and in, well, basically in all the digital animation, uh, 40 or 50 percent or sometimes more people left if there are no engaged. So I think that we learn that we need to to be more sophisticated or more surprise the reader. No, I think that and always the information is there. One thing that I like it is the expert, you know, London, Tryon, they really enjoy the, the helicoprion, the, they really enjoy the way that we approach, no? So, and because the easy thing I think is go to the traditional. So go the traditional, I, I explain in this way, the, diffi the difficult part is try to uh, try new styles or new ways to tell the stories, no? But the information, all is accurate. So all, of course, the characters, they're, sometimes they are not super realistic, but how they build or how they work, the bite or whatever, all is, all is there, no? So. Yeah, awesome. Um, Louise asks, how do you decide whether to use a 3D model in your illustration or just a sketch? Um, oh, I, I always is uh, some kind of crisis. No, so I, it's not something mathematical that, that oh, that one will be a, a 3D model, or that one will be 2D. No. So I think that there are always a lot of experiment. And you see, I drew all kinds of things. Sometimes there's people, or there are animals, or there are you know all kinds of things. So uh, take me time to figure out the way to 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 draw. No. So it's not the same to draw a ship or a, a building that uh, you know a bird. No. So try me and not always I can do it right in the first the first uh, approach. So usually it's some kind of experiment. So, and sometimes I use my models like a, like a 3D base, no? So, and I paint on top for, for example, for the buildings, it's very easy, no? So another time it's just for reference. So I think that, of course, you can find reference for bears and for some stuff, but there are, um, you know, terror, you can find reference. So, or the saber tool, you can refer, you can find reference. So, but if you create your own reference, like a model, you are allowed to, you know, to play with the light, with the perspective, and it's accurate, no? That at the end, all this needs to be accurate, no? So, yeah. So it's a little bit of experiment in some point. <laughs> well, um, and oh, he also asked, where do we find these animations? Uh, well, basically, they are all in YouTube. So I can, you want, I can send to the, you know, to the people a list of the links. So, and I think that you can find, sometimes we create, people love the behind the scenes. So I think it's, sometimes I think it's more popular than the video because how they made it, you know, I think that, and we were making the animation, some people came to the art, to the photo studio, to the art studio to see. So there are stuff that there are in YouTube. I can send you the links. You look for basically the name, of the, you know, Trajan or Sabertooth or and National Geographic, you probably will find in YouTube. Okay, great. That's, that's good. But to know. I, I, I will send the links. Eh? So. Okay, perfect. Um, Eva May asked, every project is so diverse and unique. Do you have the opportunity to pitch your own subjects or projects to Nat Geo? If so, which did you enjoy the most? Oh, the thing is, you, you never know which project you are going to enjoy more. No? So for example, you have Vikings, you think that Vikings is a, like a very cool topic, no? So the penguins, the Emperor Penguin, oh, when they assigned me the project, I wasn't really, very happy with the, oh, what can I do with the penguin? So, so, <laughs> but at the end, when you research, you always can find some kind of approach, no? And so you never know, but I really like history and I really like animals, no? For example, I didn't show, but this year I, I created another uh, graphic about the dodo, no? The stint bird. But that was my story. Saber too was, was another story that I proposed, or the helicoprion I proposed, or the Jesus tomb is something that they didn't think in a graphic, and I traveled to Jerusalem and I proposed the, the story. So we are allowed to, to you know, propose a story, and of course, my bosses need to approve. But I think it's part of the cool thing, no? that I really love the topics, so, and I really enjoy, and I learn a lot, and you know, travel to the places that I know always I travel to the place. I would love to do, but not always, no? But 
you learn a lot in the place and you can get, for example, the Amazon, if you want to, to, to paint a, a category of the rainforest, the only way to do it is go to the place. I was with a list of 50 or 60 trees and figure out, no? So that is a little bit the, so you can propose the, uh, it's the same that the size. Uh, one, our role of a graphic editor is propose how big or the concept, no? So sometimes the octopus, it was one page. But if you think that there are opportunities, you can create something big, no? So uh, we always fight a little bit with the photographers and writers with that, but, you know, so to get more room, no? Yeah, well, we love the topics as well. <laughs> um, let's see. So Fernanda said, wonderful work. In, ter in terms of your process of design and how the audience reads the images, how much you keep, how, or how much do you keep up with the use of research on neurological and cognitive basis of visualization and their application to pedagogy and science communication. Eye tracker research, uh, for example. Uh, I think that we work for two kind of audience. So the usual readers and like a medium reader and the expert. So we always try and our process to create a graphics is probably around two months and a half. So we, I make some kind of selection of the information. I have several meetings that in some point there are like exam, then we test that all people understand uh, the graphic, no? that is part of the problem. No? Sometimes you know a lot about the, pro the, the topics and so you, know, uh, you are not the usual readers. So we text, test all the time that you know, the graphics, uh, usual readers or people, writers or copy editors understand. No? So, and of course, the experts are involved during, from the beginning of the idea to the final. So mm -hmm. there are, so we always make some kind of selection and, and you know, we try to get this kind of balance, no? Need to be uh, for the expert, but at the same time, need to be for the, for the usual reader, no? So that is the, this kind of balance, no? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, so you'll have to excuse my lack of uh, Spanish on this, but uh, saludos desde España, Fernando. What's, re what resolution and, and canvas size do you work with in Photoshop when producing infographics like the Amazonas one? Congratulations on your amazing work. Thank you. So saludos desde Washington. I answered in Spanish too. <laughs> so, uh, so usually we, we work, uh, we print in 300 uh, DPA. So uh, my file sometimes, my computer crash. <laughs> so for example, with the Amazon, imagine a supplement that is uh, around 80, 80 centimeter by 60 centimeters. Usually I work with a little bit more resolution, like a, a 300 at 15 DPA or whatever. And you have 100, 100 1,000 layers or more. So for to create a tree, you have, I don't know, one of the big one, the and the nuts is like a 100 layers. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's tricky. So it's tricky and sometimes uh, you can really work very, very well because you know you don't have, you have tons of layers, no? But there are one moment when the, because for example, with the Amazon, the, I move the size, the position close to the string or, you know, all, all need to be accurate, no? So when I, the expert approved, is when I flatten and I have, you know, few layers, I have the background, I have the, you know, the, the pieces and I can play with the atmosphere and, you know, I can really, you know, enjoy more. There are one moment that you basically, you are fighting with the illustration and you can really control very, very well because, you know, it's, you know, hundreds of layers and groups. So, yeah. but, you know, I use a Wacom, uh, a Cintiq at 27 inches and, you know, but I, I always start with pencil, no? I, I, I want to keep this kind of analogic, an analog uh, feeling, no? Thank you. Um, so that's all the time we have for questions right now, but thank you for all the insight into the process behind your work. That was really amazing. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.